enjoy this and the expansion you guys did of the world is is fascinating um, just the idea that the characters themselves are learning what their world is and mapping it and getting some sense of the larger place they live um, did that what what was the original story idea for this and then how did you guys decide where to start these characters on this arc okay well after after the success of the first movie and the the proposition of doing a a sequel, I had pitched back the idea of doing a trilogy, so this, this second installment could be the middle act of a three-act story. Uh, and by starting five years later in the narrative, it meant that we didn't have to repeat Hiccup's issues as a 15-year-old. He now has a new problem as a 20-year-old, which is that he, he's standing on the cusp of adulthood, and he's facing a, a rather daunting prospect of becoming his father, uh, which is kind of an ill fit for him. And looking back at, at his youth and the freedom of mapping the world with Toothless as an expression of that restlessness. But really what it is is kind of setting up this question that if he isn't exactly a carbon copy of his father, then what is he? And, and the answer to that is, is lurking out there somewhere beyond, you know, in the lands that he has yet to map. And that is his mother that's been missing for 20 years, um, unbeknownst to everyone back on Burke. And I find it interesting that the scale of the film, it's, it's gigantic in certain scenes, but it's a very intimate story, ultimately. It's really just about um, these, these few characters and, and these family arcs. Um, and yet, you're able to still stage these gigantic, massive action sequences that are, that are really overwhelming. All oh, right. Well, thank you. Yeah, I think ultimately the story boils down to, uh, hopefully, a very universal problem, which is defining who you are. Um, in those er early years of your adulthood against s some very powerful forces, oftentimes represented by your parents. And so it, it's Hiccup coming to realize that he is equal parts, both of them, and, and yet something completely different as well. Um, one of the things that I, I always say about animated films is I, I wish more animated directors took full advantage of the medium to do things that you can't do in live action. And I feel like you guys, with the flying in particular, have done that beautifully. Um, and whether it's the individual flying sequences or the sport that you invented at the beginning of this, which J.K. Rowling must look at and just <laughs> envy the way you guys pulled it off. Um, but you, you really, uh, there is a tangible sense of how they, they move through this world and the flight in particular. Mm. Um, how important was that to you to get right and how did you guys work on that? Well, the, the physics of this world were really important for us to nail down because we wanted to create a sense that there was consequence if you fell from a great height, you would die. If you got in the way of dragon fire, you would die. Part of that was making everything believable, that the dragons themselves were not um, talking sidekicks, that they, were, they felt like animals that could have walked the earth at one point. And, and so studying fl bird flight and making sure that these animals were, uh, as we designed them, flight worthy you know, and, and capable of believably flying uh, was, was a lot of research went into that and a lot of discipline went into that in the animation. And I think it helps to create a sense of, um, of a world that we know and recognize. And, and therefore, you know, you can lose a limb or you can, uh, you know, uh, suffer consequences as a, result, as a result of engaging with dragons. For breaking entertainment news and more, follow at HitPix on Twitter or visit HitPix.com.